Good, Beautiful. thanks, bud. Can you see us okay there? Sun looks like it's right in your eyes. <laughs> yeah, the light's just, yeah, it's just come up over the hill there. Well, you do know it's good for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, through the glass, I'm not sure if it's going to Well, that's true, that's true. <laughs> Waking at dawn. So we're here with Keegan Smith. We're really stoked to have, our, have you on our show. Thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Beautiful. We've uh, been following you for some time now. And, um, you know, so much of what you're doing is resonating with us in terms of personal growth and some life philosophy and that kind of thing. So we're yeah, really stoked to be chatting to you today. Oh, thanks for having me on. I uh, listened to a few of the interviews that you've done. You've had some great people on here. So yeah, it's an honor. So it's nice to be, to be asked to be on a show and I love the work that you guys are doing. So yeah, let's, uh, let's have some fun. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, yeah. So you've, um, you've done so much in your life, Keegan, and, um, but one thing that's kind of been with you from the start is footy. Uh, your your dad and your brother both being like professional coaches and you've been involved your whole life. So tell us a little bit about how footy has uh, shaped you, you, sort of the, the man that you are today. Yeah, my uncle Tony Smith as well was an uh, England coach and bunch of, he coached a bunch of teams over there as well and played, uh, played NRL too. So wow. I've definitely always been in that environment. Um, I think a lot of it's subconscious. You know, they, they talk about what happens in the first seven years of your life stays with you for the rest of your life. And the first seven years of my life, like I went to footy training and I saw these massive guys, you know, smashing into each other and doing what rugby league is about. And I, you know, when you're two, three, four years old, you probably don't understand it. And then you start to get it a little bit more after that. But I guess I've always um, like had some of that subconsciously in my mind about what it is to be a man. And I guess rugby league players have got bigger and bigger over the years as well. And, I think that is probably part of my, my love for, you know, strength training and physical development and, and all sort of that area of human pursuit and human endeavor. I think yeah, it came in pretty early. Like I, I just wanted to, you know, to play ball sports and to strive. Um, and I, you know, I played with my brother from, from my earliest memories was sort of competing with him and, and uh, I, I competed really, really hard as a kid. Like I was, uh, <laughs> I couldn't understand the kids who weren't like ready to give everything for, you know, for what, you know, even if it was just a game of touch footy at the park, uh, you know, when we were eight years old or whatever, you know, my intensity level was always like 110%. It was actually tough through the teenage years because I just didn't understand why other people weren't like so intense uh, about winning and competing and um, just going really hard. And I guess, yeah, it probably was programmed into me. I probably it's probably my dad's halftime talks and <laughs> and um, and full time talks. And he was he was uh, he had a bit of a reputation for being a, a very angry man, uh, especially in the early half of his career as a coach. Um, so former players and stuff that that he worked with when I was sort of a ball boy and that sort of thing when I was you know, maybe 10, 12 years old and. Yeah, you know, yeah. He he was uh, he had a very big reputation as an angry man, and I think I. Uh, took a lot of that intensity into, into my own life and my own endeavors and battled with uh, how to measure that intensity socially and to what was socially acceptable when you're doing school sport, you know, and you're playing against the girls as well. You know, like, <laughs> is it like, how, how hard can you go? You know, um, how, in, how important is winning and that sort of thing. Like those were real challenges for me in my teens, probably because of that programming, you know, as a, as a kid. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. sure. Is it is, is it something that like you have to play barefoot as as youngsters in Australia? Yeah, like I mean, I guess now like there's not everybody plays, but when I was a kid, like everybody everybody was playing some footy, and it was a lot of touch footy. And you know, I I actually didn't go that far with playing you know proper laced up uh, footy or cricket or any of that stuff, but. You know, we played every day before school, lunchtime, after school, and it was like my life revolved around it. And mm -hmm. I think it had the same intensity as it would have if it was weekend cricket or if I was representing my, you know, my region or my state or whatever. It was kind of the same thing, whether it was just, um, you know, with the with the mates at lunchtime as well. You know, like I, I think I brought the same intensity to it, regardless of 
what level it was at, you know? <laughs> so you were one of those guys that people always like try to avoid or they, <laughs> they <was> I'm, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty tackled sure. by Keegan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I, I don't know if I was like, I was a runt as well. So I wasn't a massive physical presence. I, I just competed really hard. I just, I just wanted to, uh, to chase everything down. And I actually started playing hockey. I started playing field hockey when I was like uh, 10 one of my mates played and he just invited me along. And then um, I think just because I was physically, you know, physically active and determined, I, I sort of went okay. And then I ended up, you know, getting right into that. And that was kind of the path I followed um, athletically, but it was always, I guess, the drive to, you know, go hard, whatever sport I did, we did lots of different sports, you know, footy was always there um, to sort of watch on the weekends and we played you know played a lot of footy I went and fetched the balls for my brother a lot he, his dream was NRL but my you know my sporting focus shifted to hockey when I was sort of 10 years old um, in terms of like trying to play uh, you know playing on weekends and that sort of stuff yeah yeah and you mentioned your dad uh, Brian uh, he was what was considered one of the, like the greatest minds in footy coaching um, and he actually coached a good friend of mine, uh, Sean Lestrange, which is makes it such a small world. Uh, what what actually made him so good? Why was he like one of the best? I think he came into the world of footy when it was uh, just starting to become more professional. So he his background was a PE teacher. He grew up in the country. Uh, my grandfather was you know, very into sports and I think sport was almost the way out. Uh, it's, it's kind of that traditional story of boy grows up in the country and dreams of going to the big smoke in, in sport, I guess. And um, he, yeah, my dad talks about like not having shoes until he was 10 years old and riding his horse to school and all that sort of thing. Like he was on a dairy farm and, um, you know, had great memories as a kid. My grandparents still had those dairy, that dairy farm. So he got out of, country living and I think he, he really wanted to do that and, and all my um, aunties and uncles you know went into professions as well you know so that was kind of the transition from the land uh, into professional work and then I've sort of tried to transition a little bit back to the land which is kind of happening quite a bit with you know <laughs> different generations but yeah he, he went to the city studied to be a PE teacher and I think he brought some of the um, the pedagogy of, of teaching to, to rugby league and really try to break things down and teach it. Um, he didn't take it on face value that because they're professional athletes, they didn't you know, need necessarily to, to work on the basics. Like he was very, very big on the fundamentals. Um, and then he started to go over to the U S uh, during these off seasons. So he went and spent time with, he spent time with a lot of the different American football teams uh, and college teams. So he read a lot of the books of the American football coaches and, I think that was really what sort of that was the big impact that he made on rugby league was really systemizing uh, a lot of rugby league player development and putting a lot of detail uh, into his coaching in a time where it was still just transitioning from, you know, tra train a little bit, have some beers with the boys and then turn up on the weekend and see what happens kind of thing. Like he, I think he really shifted that. Um, and then I think because of that, a lot of, players and coaches came out from under him. So a lot of guys who he coached um, or people who were his assistants moved into the world of coaching as well. So that was probably a big part of his legacy where there were times where, you know, almost all the probably like 50% or 60% of the coaches in the league had actually been assistants to my dad or, or played under him, um, you know, because he'd been around for such a long time. Like that, was, that's probably a big part of his legacy. He's still working in rugby league. Actually, he's gone back to work with the, the New Zealand Warriors now as the head of football. Uh, but yeah, he, he brought a lot of detail in sort of trying to systemize, um, athlete, you know, player development, athletic development. Um, and yeah, that was probably a, a his biggest success. Yeah. Well, you definitely like sort of, um, glean some of that from him by, by the sounds of it as well. You know, some of that system, like that intensity and systemization, which is, which is pretty cool. The, the intensity that my brother and, and dad brought to coaching is like something that I don't, I don't, I don't really necessarily identify with that much. Like other people can probably see it a bit, but uh, my, my brother, especially, you know, he's just really, um, he's just been so driven to, to become a professional coach and he's been coaching since uh, like his late teens. He's, he's a couple of years older than me. So 
he's worked with a lot of different NRL clubs and in England and stuff. And he's just his ability to get up first thing in the morning, watch tape, you know, record things, cut things, deliver it to players, go to training, go do that again. Um, just he's just completely obsessed with it. When he gets time off, he's like watching. Uh, the American football and basketball and reading books from those guys. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think, you know, I think he's really going to make an impact on the world of coaching as, mm-hmm. as well. Uh, he, he delivers some education stuff to coaches in the, you know, the level one and level two systems and that sort of thing in Australia, but it, he still hasn't got his shot as a NRL uh, head coach. And I think he's done the longest apprenticeship anyone <laughs> will ever do. Like he, he will have done more than 20 years uh, as a coach by the time he gets there where a lot of coaches come out of playing and they finish playing when they're you know, 30 something. And then they, you know, they get into coaching within five or 10 years of that, you know, they get a, a job at the top. So um, yeah, I'm excited for what he'll do with that. But I guess they're kind of, I've always kind of looked at their work ethic with what they do and, and felt a bit lazy, you know, <laughs> I've never, never been able to, to go as hard and, uh, <laughs> Maybe I just uh, maybe I just a bit have a bit more time on the fringes of uh, what I'm into. Like I, when I have free time, it's it's also sort of goes into this same sort of you know research and, and trying to learn more about um, things that are kind of on the fringe of my core business. But in terms yeah. of like working hard on developing a team, like it's a it's a big job. I, I don't know if people in normal roles can really comprehend it, but it's doesn't end you know it's like having your own business but you, you, like there's there's so many things that you don't control there's really only one maybe maybe there's one team that's really successful there's you know three or four teams that are moderately successful um, and the rest of the teams are basically considered failures each year you know so it's a it's a tough world and yeah there's a, you know some pretty obsessive behaviors there in the family that have gone with that <laughs> <laughs> So talking about um, your work, you were mentioning now that um, the kinds of stresses that are on um, these footy athletes is obviously like super high and, and, um, you know, physically, mentally. um, And I'm trying to wonder if the professional athlete, especially like in the footy world, is a good testing ground for like health and performance tactics or new tactics. Because I guess the cracks will show pretty quickly if, if they're not working. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, some some players are very relaxed about their careers, and I think it's the coaching world compared to the playing world is is very different uh, in terms of what goes into it. Some some players really do work hard on their craft, and they really pride themselves on what they do. Uh, a lot of players turn up and do what the coaches say, and and you know, sort of don't necessarily take massive ownership of of their path. Um, and I guess that's probably something that we try to work on when I was in the world of strength and conditioning, working full time with those athletes. And now I have a you know, consulting role uh, in that area with the roosters, like asking them questions about what they want to achieve and, you know, what they want to change and how, you know, how can I help you being my, you know, a, a first question rather than, you know, you need to be doing X, Y, Z. Mm. I try to start with what, what they actually want to achieve and helping them to take a little bit more ownership and realize there's more things in their control than, than maybe they realized um, I think a lot of footy players in particular are kind of victims of always having had, you know, professional coaching. Um, so sometimes they, they do wait for the coach to say, well, you need to do, you need to work on this and this, and, you know, you need to add this to your game and that you weren't doing that well enough. Um, and probably there probably isn't the level of personal review or personal responsibility that maybe you get in individual sports and less professional sports where there's less, less access to coaching uh, I think, you know, if you're going to make it in hockey, that was, you know, the sport I was into, some of the guys at the top of that sport, they really directed their own path, you know, and they, yes, they had coaches and they took feedback from coaches, um, but some of them had really phenomenal work ethic for executing on their own uh, in the way an individual sport athlete sort of um, might do. Mm. But yeah, the other part of your question there, it is a good testing ground. Like it's, it's good. It's a good area to work in if you love physical development or human performance or, you know, just seeing humans strive because there's a test each week, there's a Mm. test each year, there's a test. And so you sort of say, well, did this culture work? Did this, you know, did this strength program work? Did this approach to nutrition work? You know, what are we going to try next year? Mm. Um, Or, you know, what are we going to try next week? Like, did we overcook them this week? You know, did they, you know, and and you have a guy coming back from injury and you have an experiment with them, you know, and, you know, they've got months where they can't, 
be on the field and it's like, okay, well, what can we do with this athlete during this time? Mm. You know, mentally in terms of their habits off the field, in terms of their physical development of the parts of the body that they can use. Um, those, those sort of journeys and those times are, you know, they're exciting times. And that's, yeah, that's what, I guess it's easy in the modern world for nothing to matter. It's easy to sort of think, well, does it even matter if I go to work today? Does it matter how I train, you know, this Betty? You know, I think it's a pr problem that a lot of personal trainers have is like attaching real value to the journey that they're taking someone on or someone who turns up to their, their classes or their CrossFit or whatever. If you can attach some real value to it, and if they can attach some real value to it, then there's so much more that can be gained out of it. And I think feeling insignificant, powerless, and as though your journey doesn't really matter is, is a big part of the challenge in the 21st century. Like too many people feel like that mm. and it results in, you know, self-destructive behaviors, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, like trying to make life matter for a little while, or do something that mm. shifts the brain out of like neutral, like, you know, and, mm. and I guess that's what you get with footy. You, you know, every week there's something that matters and they've got, you know, the screaming fans and, and all that sort of thing. And, you know, people care about what you're up to. Um, so in that way, like it's, it's a good world uh, to be a part of. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and when you say footy, maybe we can uh, give it a bit of a description um, because, you know, and, and there's, you know, there's a few things that are come under the umbrella of footy, but uh, when it comes to the difference between league and union, maybe you can explain that to us. And then also why union is probably the better of the two. <laughs> got the, uh, got the AFL ball there in the background. <laughs> yeah, no, I know exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, so the rugby league is the thirteen aside um, game, whereas you know the rugby union is the, the fifteen aside. Rugby union is much more of a global sport. Uh, rugby league is much more popular in Australia. Uh, in Australia, if, you know, uh, yeah, there's not too many people that would value rugby union over rugby league. Uh, it's still it really struggles domestically. You know, the Super 15 or, yeah, or whatever yeah. it is, um, it doesn't really get too much traction over here. And, and the Wallabies have been you know rubbish for a while as well. So it's <laughs> not too uh, it's not too popular here. Oh, at least from what I see. But yeah, I mean, the, I think the primary difference is there's a lot more specialization in positions in the 15 side game. So you have like short, stocky guys, you have super tall guys, and then you have your, sort of your backs, your skill positions. Like there's a huge variation where rugby league is, is a lot more, um, the guys are much more similar, more homogenous. Um, so it's sort of everybody has to be able to carry the ball. Everybody has to have, you know, quite a bit of skill uh, in terms of being able to catch and pass and, and that sort of thing. Or there's at least an opportunity in every position to, to develop footwork and to develop skill. And to, you know, there's, there's a lot of similarities between a winger and a front rower in rugby league. They're actually almost interchangeable in some ways. Um, and sometimes that change does happen where obviously in rugby, you, you know, you're not going to see that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, yeah, there's always kind of jokes about which, which one is the, is the good one. But um, yeah, there's yet to be, you know, there's not too many guys from 15 aside that actually can make it in 13 aside. And, and often there hasn't been the incentive to do that, but it, it really hasn't happened very much. Uh, where 13 aside guys have been able to transition to the 15 aside game and, and go and play international footy within a year or two. Um, so it'll be interesting if there if there is a trend back with that, and uh, I think my dad wants to run a few experiments with that because he's working in New Zealand at the moment. There's obviously a lot of talent mm. in the 15 aside game, so yeah, it could be. Hopefully, he'll uh, he'll get something going there. He's a pioneer in that sort of area. He brought he brought a, a few different uh, American football guys over to try to play for for Parramatta a few years back, um, and he's always kind of experimented with trying to bring guys from uh, from other sports and in, into uh, into the water rugby league so yeah then maybe that'll happen in with some rugby and you guys coming over uh, to, to rugby league to play for the warriors in the next couple of years yeah it's, it's always interesting like coming from south africa you know we think that union is the only thing and then <laughs> when i moved to london like um it's all my like aussie mates and stuff and they're like 
we don't even play union in Australia, you know, like, <laughs> like our fifth sports or something. And we were like, no way is I can that be possible. <laughs> but, yeah, it's uh, like a private school kind of thing as well. Like that, that, that definitely was the connotation with it growing up. Like you could only really play it if you went to a school where you had to wear a tie and a blazer. You know, <laughs> most of Australia, you don't wear that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> so um, a few years ago, you were also on the shortlist uh, or it, to be a trainer at, at Liverpool FC. How did that sort of come about and, and what is the etymology of that? Yeah, so Hayden Knowles kind of um, built that up a little bit more. But Hayden, Hayden Knowles was a good top level strength and conditioning coach here in Australia. And he kind of got me started actually in strength and conditioning. So he worked for my dad there at Parramatta for a number of years. Uh, and he'd worked in soccer and athletics as well. So he brought a pretty diverse background to, to what he was doing. And Hayden's like a, an amazing energetic guy and uh, very well connected. Um, so he was uh, friends with the, the head of performance there uh, at Liverpool and who was the ex-Australian uh, head of uh, strength and conditioning with the, with the Australian team when we actually went okay at one of those World Cups back there, maybe 2006 or so. Um, so he had a connection there and uh, I was, yeah, I was sort of looking for work and then he was, uh, yeah, he was basically trying to sort of help him out with, uh, with, connecting up with with some staff at that stage and i was looking to get back into strength and conditioning uh, and then i ended up in france uh, instead so i ended up with the with the catalan dragons which was the perfect role for me at the time i'd been backpacking sort of between uh well 21 really i left australia and 28 i decided to get back into strength and conditioning um, and so i hadn't been doing much strength and conditioning through that time uh, so yeah it was kind of trying to get back into that world. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the French job suited me well because I'd been living a lot of time in Latin America and I'd really you know, fall in love with learning different languages and really didn't want to be in Sydney uh, in the heart of rugby league world after kind of all the alternative thinking and life experiences that I'd had in, uh, during those explorative years. You know, I, I, I couldn't really see myself uh, in Sydney. So the job in the South of France was kind of the least rugby league world kind of place to be like where there's least <laughs> sort of media and um, and that sort of thing and, and being a foreign language as well was something that that excited me so yeah i was glad i i ended up there i did actually get the chance to present there i a little did at, at liverpool we went for a visit and uh i did a sort of 10 15 minute presentation for their staff which is sort of what they get people who come and visit uh, to do hmm. i guess it's a bit of a buy-in to if you really want to go and see it yeah. to, you know put you under this under pressure a little bit so but that, that was that was nice it was probably better for me than it was for them but um yeah i'm glad i i'm glad it went the way it did go uh, i'm not sure how i would have gone in that soccer environment you know where it's um, <laughs> strength training definitely doesn't play the same role as it does in rugby league right like <laughs> the players know it doesn't have the same impact. Like you can be a great player without doing, you know, much work in the gym. Um, some players definitely do do a bunch of work in the gym and it helps them to make it to that top level. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of guys who don't do any work in the gym and they still make the, make the millions, you know, where that doesn't happen in, in rugby league mm. or rugby union. Almost, you know, almost never, you know, there's very few players who don't work hard in the gym and, and make it to the top level and make mm. an impact in the top level. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, it's, I'm glad I stayed in the, uh, in the, in the muscle head world. <laughs> <laughs> and you obviously strength and conditioning is your forte, right? Uh, but at one point, uh, you were, you suffered, I think from uh, chronic fatigue. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, when it happened, how did it come about? Yeah, I guess through that time backpacking, I was probably my, I was, I guess, so focused on trying to learn where I was going in life, what I was going to do with myself, you know, through my twenties, sort of involved with political organizations and agricultural projects in, in sort of rural Mexico. And um, I lived in different environments there where my own health and my own life wasn't really my priority. Like I was trying to do something for those people and, and sort of learn about, you know, what their life was all about. So I ate like they ate, I, I slept on the floor, you know, for, for a lot of the time and drank the water that had come out of the river. And um, 
yeah, it didn't really agree with me uh, to live on sort of beans and tortillas. And I, I messed around with being vegetarian. I think it was part of my rebellious sort of stage and wanting people to understand that I was different after all the adventures and things that I'd been on. Like I, I went through some, yeah, some pretty big experiences there in my twenties and, and had a lot of thoughts about, you know, what's wrong with the world and how it could, could change and, and shift. And um, I think sort of letting my own health deteriorate was almost like part of representing that physically and manifesting that physically. And I guess we all sort of do that where we, we manifest what's going on in our psychology physically and, so when I started to get back into strength training, uh, when I wanted to sort of, I, I kind of hit a low point at the end of, I'd had three years in Latin America on and off with trips back to Australia to make some money in between. And um, yeah, I gradually I got sort of more politicized and got into more, you know, uh, active organizations and trying to make change uh, in, in sort of rural Mexico and then, one of the ladies that I worked with got assassinated and that was kind of a turning point where I was like, fuck, like, um, this is like almost, this is a kill or be killed kind of situation. Like if I'm going to stay on this path, like this is probably where it's going. And, you know, there were times where I thought that was the solution. You know, I read a lot of Che Guevara and, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, history of Latin America and it's a very violent, you know, modern history where people were trying to create political change. You guys are from South Africa, like you, you know, <laughs> violent <laughs> political, you know, situations and that sort of thing. It's, it's very, you know, very complex socially and people, um, you know, have, have different perspectives on it and such. But, you know, when I was sort of with those, those people, uh, I just didn't, yeah, I didn't know. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to support um, them to have a better life. And I think that is, kind of how things circle around with real movement is like a massive, I believe in human potential and just sort of seeing these kids and, and people in sort of rural Mexico. And I worked in orphanage in Guatemala for a while. And it's like, like, what are these kids going to do? Like, what are they going to grow up to be? And they could grow up to be anything. Some of them would get adopted out and go to the U S and they would fall into the U S system and they would be like normal American kids, you know, um, and other ones would not be shaped by that kind of environment. And, you know, they'll probably end up living on the street or in, you know, the worst of what happens to, to the dispossessed in Guatemala. You know what I mean? It's like, why, like, why, the, why is the system like this in this time? Like we have so much technology, so much possibility. Like, yes, they live in different countries, but it's one, it's one world. And like, there's no reason that, you know, these things can't be shared and, and that sort of mm. thing. So all this stuff was going on in my head. And I guess that was, you know, I, yeah, my, I'd had digestive issues in the past. Uh, I was told I had the irritable bowel when I was like 17, when I started taking a lot of sports supplements and I was just eating a lot of junk, like trying to put on weight. Um, probably started to drink alcohol, started to have more takeaway foods. And um, yeah, I thought eating noodles and baked beans and those sort of things were good, like bulking foods. And so I had digestive weakness and there's a lot of that kind of family history of that sort of stuff so I had digestive weakness which is a great place to start if you want to have you know adrenal fatigue or um any of that sort of stuff so I was never you know diagnosed with anything I didn't I haven't I don't really go to the doctor very much and don't really believe in that stuff too much but I had all the symptoms of you know, any of those kind of conditions um and yeah it was when i wanted to get back into strength and conditioning and i actually started training hard was when i really fell in a hole with it gareth to answer the question so i um, i would go and train and then i'd go home and lay in the dark like just with a massive kind of headache and just feel like i had no energy at all and then i would go and train again the next day wow. because i wanted to get some physical presence back to be able to go and work that job in, in strength and conditioning in france and obviously i thought that you know i needed to be healthy for that as well but like i guess wanting to be a bit stronger was more of a priority and i was actually going and training with um the head coach at that time so he was the assistant at the roosters uh trent robinson and he was who i was going with to to france so we would train together so i would turn up and train with him and that was a bit of how i got the job and how we built the relationship was kind of because we were spending that time together as well so that made me more passionate about learning about food and, and I really started to research, you know, more into to food and wellness and yeah, I understand what it feels like to struggle in terms of physical energy, in terms of health and vitality to go and train. You know, a lot of the, 
fitness motivators and I'm a big Joe Rogan fan. I don't know if you guys are Rogan fans. Love him. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, often he has those rants of like, just, just fucking do it. Just, you know, just start and just get it done and just do something, you know, like there's no excuse for doing nothing. And he is right. But I do know what it feels like when you literally feel like every action you take is like stealing from your energy and vitality and, you know, you're going to feel worse because of it. But he is right because doing like three push ups one day and then four the next. And then eventually you get to a point where, you know, you can do cool shit again. And I, I kind of actually fell in the hole recently, Gareth. Like this year, I tried to get as lean as I've ever been while I was in Europe. Um, so I had a really good first half of the year with terms of energy and vitality. And then I, I, I started, you know, training really hard while I was there in Europe. I was doing sort of two hour sessions, an hour of weights, and then like cardio you know, long steady state stuff, which I haven't never really done that kind of fat burning zone stuff too much. And then I'd go for sauna and I was just hitting it really hard and I got as lean as I've ever been. Um, but then sometime, you know, sort of towards the end of that, I, I really hit a wall of fatigue. Like I've never really hit. And I was eating like pure protein kind of diet. Um, and it can be very effective. Like I, I burn a lot of fat, but somewhere within that and probably also because I was lost a bit of direction professionally and, um, there's challenges with having two young kids and a you know young family and traveling the world and all that sort of thing. And for whatever reason, I got to a point where I just wanted to lay down most of the time and just was really struggling. And I think the mental and the physical, you can't really separate, mm. you know, but I, I fell in a hole again and I actually went back to the Roosters, you know, because I worked with the Roosters last year and they won the premiership and I, I was around for the last six weeks of that. I moved back from Europe directly to, to Sydney. Uh, and I, I was there for you know the last six weeks towards the, through the finals and, and for the premiership. And I actually booked the accommodation to till after the grand final, you know, a, a while before um, <laughs> I was pretty confident that they were going to go to the grand final and be a good chance of winning. And it, you know, it turned out they were, but through that time, like I sort of jumped back into training thinking I'll do what I did when I was there and trying to sort of be part of the crew and add to the energy and that sort of thing. And I, I just fell in this hole and I was just, it was a really tough time for me because I was trying to make a contribution there to the culture and to, you know, to the group, but I really wasn't in a great state um, to do it. So moving back to the farm uh, after that, I was, I really came back here after we won the premiership just thinking like, where, where's my life going? Like, what are, mm. what are we doing here? Um, and so the farm and, and just starting with the, the animals and all that sort of stuff was just a real thing to have consistency. Like you have to look after the animals each day. So I've got like 35 uh, animals here pigs and ducks and chickens and rabbits and guinea pigs and geese. And um, I've wanted to experience that. And as part of like, for, since living in rural Mexico and thinking like food security is kind of a foundation mm. for autonomous thinking and autonomous living. And if we could just have a little bit more control over our own ability to feed ourselves and, and, and connection to that, then, you know, we'll probably live better. We'll probably value mm. our food more and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of different levels that I value that on. But it was also psychologically just to have something I needed to do each day that kind of mattered. Like if you don't feed the animals, that matters. And I got yeah. to the point where I didn't really, I couldn't really find stuff that really mattered. Like I don't have a job to go to that kind of kicks you into rhythm. Mm. Um, I've been sort of self, self-employed for, since I left pro sport in 2014 and I'd almost arrived to a retirement type situation, you know, where there's money coming in, but I wasn't really doing that much for it. I have a supplement business that you know does that. And I just lost so much direction. Um, and so, yeah, physically, like I was just trying to use the farm as like, you know, get out and walk around and be in the sun and just see if this recharges and gets you back to the point where you can train. And it, to be honest, it wasn't really working that much. And I was just listening almost to that Rogan type stuff. It probably was specifically off that and seeing a few of my friends, you know, doing well with, with their training, I actually started a new gym program. And I thought like, what's the easiest gym program I can do? Like, what's the lowest intensity thing? Like, I don't even care about numbers. I just need to be doing something consistently and just see where it goes. And so I started this program that's like two sets of five and three different movements. Mm. If you know weight training, like that's, that's, that's not much. You do two sets of five each, uh, th two sets of five on three movements each day. Uh, and it's, and it's, but it's a daily thing. And so you do it at least five days a week. Sometimes I'll do it seven days a week. Um, there's a few nuances within it, but that's basically it. And just doing that. And I started with like really low numbers and just like, doesn't matter. Just do it. Just do two sets of five. It doesn't matter about the intensity. It doesn't have to be like 80% of max or anything. Just do two sets of five. 
Hmm. And uh, within 10 weeks, you know, and Craig sort of commenting on some of the stuff, just being, being kind as he is, um, <laughs> but I actually hit some personal best and lifetime personal best at the end of 10 weeks of that coming out of that sort of whole of Europe and weird time in Sydney. And I guess that is the foundation for a lot of what I like, you know, what I teach and what I believe in is that if you can have a physical transformation, a physical experience, to base your self belief on and to base your, your motivation on, then there's going to be a lot more power there than just listening to stuff. Like I, I'm a big believer in listening to, you know, listen to Joe Rogan, listen to, you know, motivational uh, information. I, I do that stuff every day, but if there's a physical manifestation of your progress that you can mm. tangibly go like, yes, I didn't used to be able to do this. Now I can do this. Like they marry together very well. Mm. And I think that's a great place to create an existence that matters and to believe in your ability to change other areas of your life. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the journey, like the two times that I've probably felt worst were, were like just earlier this year and mm. back when I was uh, just about to start in uh, restart. My first role as head of a strength and conditioning program with the Catalan Dragons was when I really felt my worst when I was just mm. about to go over there and then actually hurt my back. Like the, I flew over there all excited to start this new role, like nervous as anything. All the meetings were in French. Like the coaches were speaking <laughs> French. The head coach already spoke French. He's Australian guy, Trent Robinson, but he'd, he'd worked with Toulouse before. So the coaches were all chatting away in French and I'm sitting there like trying to pick things up. And I'd had experience with that because I'd done the same thing in Germany and, and, and in, in Latin America and, um, you know, lots of different languages. I kind of enjoyed that experience, but I was definitely sort of overwhelmed and nervous and, mm. I got a session in just before we we're about to start. I think the day before we started, um, and I was squatting a hundred kilos. I remember it was a hundred kilos. And I was doing it for five. Um, and in the bottom of the squat, one of them reps, I just felt this, Oh, ah. I hope that's not too bad. And then I had, I laid down and thought, Oh, that's not great. And then I was like, Oh, that really doesn't feel good. And I went back to my room and actually spent the next three days, like dreading going to the toilet, like crawling oh. to the toilet. I lived oh, in this little God. apartment that I'd arrived to. I didn't know anyone, you know, in France. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, that was kind of how things started. And I was embarrassed as well because I was a strength coach and I had it like, Oh, just, Oh, he's not coming to work. He's got a bad back. Yeah. I like, literally couldn't, couldn't drag myself off the floor, <laughs> but uh, I did a lot of praying and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of thinking in that time and it came good and we had two good years in France. So um, yeah, that's, uh, some of the, some of the challenges that, that I've been through on the, on the journey, highs and lows. Mm -hmm. sure. I guess, you know, I guess overcoming stuff is part of that journey. And, and when you have overcome, it's not that everything goes smooth in your life. It's, it's the way you overcome things and how you go afterwards is that really matters, I guess. And, and that's, you know, you, you've found that again by overcoming those hurdles, I guess. And I mean, you've just come so far now, which is, which is really cool. So, You've got to artificially put them in as well a lot of the time now. Like, I think in the past, it was there. Like, you've you got to go hunt or you starve. Like, mm. come home with food or don't come home. Like, mm. you know, like, mm. there were times where, you know, and it's not far back in human history. Like, mm. all of our ancestors knew how to slaughter animals. And, you know, like, up until very, very recently, like, that was, that was what you did. Like, even if you were hurting them and stuff, like, times, the times have changed very quickly. And I think that change has made it hard to live in the modern time. Like you have to, or you have to invent challenges for yourself yeah. or you're going to feel like you're not challenged. And then, and then within that you lose self belief and you know, you lose your, your power in the world and your ability to, you know, ultimately it's, you know, suicide rates and depression, you know, depression, drug sales and those sorts of things showing that it's, it's very hard to live, you know, for in the, in the modern world. I believe this is, you know, at the heart of it. And even like, you know, creating a podcast, like I, I've been through this challenge. I haven't done it as well as you guys. That, <laughs> like that in itself, like you manifest a challenge for yourself that you can go, well, yeah, we, you know, we're doing this thing. Like, and mm. you, you, you solve a lot of different problems around, you know, planning and scheduling. And, and now you've got this, you've invented this thing in your lives that mm. Is a you know it can be a like it's a big thing to do. It's a challenging thing to do. It can be you know are we going to nail this and all the different self doubt and questions that come with you know creating anything. But if you don't do those things, if you don't launch into it, if you just sit back and think ah oh, yeah like probably don't want to listen anyway, I won't do it. 
you know, or, you know, like who cares if I can lift a bit more weight or who cares if I get my body composition a bit better this year or who cares if I start a business or whatever the thing is, right? If you don't put those artificial things, you know, challenged into your life, because they are artificial compared to the primal thing of like, yeah. either kill this bear or this bear kills me and yeah. one of us is going to feel satisfied at the end of this encounter. <laughs> like those, those situations very rarely arise now. So uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in that sort of process of mm. whatever it is that you can, you've kind of feel an itch of like, I probably should start a podcast, like talking to some cool people or, you know, whatever it is that excites you guys about it, you know, why, why you did it. You know, it's even the connection that you have to each other and that sort of thing. Like yeah. there's so many benefits that come out of it when you take action. Mm. Um, but it's, it's so easy just to sort of sit back and think, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it, do it one day. Like, uh, I'm not sure when that day will be, but, uh, you know, I'll do it one day. And that's, I think that's, yeah, that's a big part of what my life is about now is about helping people just to just do it. Like take, take that next step, that thing that you, you think you'd like to do, like start that now. Like don't, don't worry about getting it all organized. Did you, how long did you guys procrastinate about starting the podcast? <laughs> no, well, we spoke about it probably for a, few, a couple of years. We mentioned it <laughs> and then two yeah. years after we started, but we didn't actually procrastinate really. Yeah. Once we, said, once, you actually made the decision? once we made the decision, there was a three month plan. We stuck to it. We launched, we did it. So we, we were pretty, yeah. but, but also, but also because we were aware of what you're talking about, Keegan, you know what I mean? Like yep. we, we, we had done a lot of procrastinating in one way or another in our lives, maybe before that. And then we were like, okay, this is not going to be the same. Do you know what I mean? So it was a conscious decision. Otherwise we quite easily could have done exactly what you're saying, you know? Yeah, and, and, yeah, and you know is. what the other thing is, I think Keegan, like, and I was actually writing about this today. It's interesting that we're talking about it now. Like, we, pers this is a personal thing. I find when I have someone that is relying on me, right, I'm going to show up much more than if it's just me, which is mm. really kind of strange in a way. Not in every situation, but in a lot of situations. So, is it strange though? I don't know. Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe it's not strange. So, you know, because... I knew that Craig was, you know, also involved in this. I was never going to let him down. Like never, yeah, yeah. ever. Um, if it was just me, it could have still been flipping a, a thing in my mind. You know what I mean? Not even yep, yep. starting it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we're, we're communal beings like this. So much of our education and, you know, the system now is about individualism and it's, a, you know, your individual bank account, your social media accounts, your, you know, your school grades are individual, but really your success in life is determined by your ability to connect with other people and execute things together, uh, whether you're the leader or whether it's, you know, cooperatively or, or whatever, like all great human achievement is done in collective. You know? mm. And I, I think that being a valuable member of a tribe is, is something very much at the core of our being as well. Like I think that's been going on for a long time um, you know, there's an element of it, like the pigs hang together really closely and there's, you know, there's hierarchy and stuff there. There's things that go on and it probably runs, you know, it runs through the ducks. It runs through, like, I guess if you, if you listen to uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, he takes it back to the lobsters. Like yeah. <laughs> that stuff has been going on in our brains for a long time. And I, like, it's not necessarily about you being the alpha, but you need to contribute to your tribe. And mm. I think when you don't feel like you're contributing to your tribe, if you don't feel like you have a tribe, you know, then you're like this, you know, Neanderthal, you know, primeval man wandering in the jungle on your own. Like how long would you last? You know, mm. you, you needed to have crew. Mm. Otherwise when other humans see you, they're probably going to you know, kick your ass yeah. or eat you, you know, totally. and, and, and all the other animals are thinking the same. So I think it's, it's such a, such a big thing that we need to have connective, you know, collection, collective accountability, connection, and I think that's the blessing of being in a rugby team as well. Like I think on average in general, the mental health of rugby league players would be really high. I think sometimes the young players when they're on the fringe and they get injured um, is a really dangerous time. Like there are usually a couple of, you know, there's often a suicide each year, you know, in the league. And it's generally like one of the young players often from, you know, Ireland or background uh, where they feel pressure from the family to make it and to, mm you know, to, to, to provide for generations. Um, generally I would say the guys have really great, good mental health because they have this 
pack to turn up to each day mm. and play their role within that pack. And yes, some of them are the alpha and some of them are, you know, they play different roles within the, the crew, but I think it's, it is so important. And yeah, sometimes it's Gareth, like it is like launch, let's do this together. Um, and I was thinking about that with real movement as well. And the times when real movement has done best, and that's, that's the business that I launched when I left the NRL, the times where it's done best, I have had connection with people. And to be honest, like I've battled with working with other people and it's probably exactly what I was talking about um, with how I was as a child. Like I'm <laughs> wanting to go at this thing with a thousand percent intensity. And if someone's not turning up for a day, um, I'm like, what the, what the hell's going on? And I have my off days as well. But when I have an on day, if someone else isn't having an on day, yeah. then I'm like, you know, what the hell's wrong with this person? And, you know, and then, you know, that's, uh, that's a big challenge as well. But honestly, like the best times in real movement have always been built around when, you know, when the team's been, you know, when I've been working with other people who've been helping me to grow the project of real movement, but also, you know, the people that we've worked with and mentored, like having that responsibility to them is, is another thing. So I think, if, if someone's thinking about starting a podcast and they're thinking like, I don't necessarily want to do it with someone else, I would say like attach that responsibility to your audience and say like, mm. what if there's a conversation I'm going to have here that's going to change someone's life? What if it's going to turn someone around when they're, when they're in a hole? And if I don't have this conversation, that person's not going to turn around. You know, maybe my audience mm. isn't going to be as big as Joe Rogan's and I'm not going to be making 60,000 or whatever an episode that he's making. Um, but if there's someone there that if I don't do this thing, then I'm not going to influence that person. Like mm. playing those mind games, I think can, can really help. And to be honest, like that's probably what's got me going again with real movement. We just relaunched real movement. Um, thinking about how many people had big life changes within, mm. you know, what we were doing before is a big part of like me being able to get myself moving again. And I have like an accountability partner. I, I feel out like a diary uh, each day. Uh, most days you know, it's not not always perfect but you know i do a diary each day that's like tasks to get done and that sort of thing and i have a mate who's you know a great sort of um business entrepreneur and just awesome guy solves a lot of problems and we check in about have you been doing your book and what do you need to do next and and he actually was like because i started talking about like getting real movement going again he's like do it like what do you like just start now do it now like you, and having that connection as well you know is is important so i think you know looking for those structures and connections, I, I believe is the, is the key guys. Like you've, you've hit the nail on the head, like, and it's, yeah, people think they're going to do good things on their own because they see that. And that's kind of how things are portrayed, but mm. it's, it's never on it's, people who do great things. It's never on their own. Like one way or another, it's, it's about serving. It's about the people who help along the way. Um, totally. And, and to, just before we get on to real uh, movements, um, a couple of things that you said there, which, you know, lots of stuff I've kind of read about and thought about a lot lately and also just reading some of your posts on Insta, just talking about like family and, you know, family now is like, it's kind of very singular and isolated. It's just you and your family looking after your own kids. And, um, you know, that's actually um, also a recent thing, you know, like we, yeah. we used to be in tribes and we all used to sort of look after each other's kids and, and it's also weird, like, or it, it seems weird because when I speak to some of my friends that are from like Eastern Europe or uh, India and stuff, their parent, they still live with their parents and stuff. And you're like, mm. that's weird. Why do you do that? But actually, this is how we have always lived. Do you know what I mean? It's so looked down on now, right? Like, it's embarrassing to say you live with your parents. Like even once you're, as soon as you finish school or finish uni, it's like, if you live with your parents, you're a loser. Like that's how it's portrayed in movies and sitcoms and whatever. And our culture is like, you've got to get out of the house. But yeah, I think the modern family, it's, it's a difficult, difficult uh, construct. Like not having cousins and, you know, aunts and uncles and grandparents around to help look after the kids um and to support the relationship like i think it's very difficult for a man and wife you know to, to stay together and you know if you look at like sex at dawn and those sorts of things like mm. a lot of people are questioning monogamous monogamous relationships and those sorts of things but when you put that in the context of sole responsibility over you know multiple other beings and, and not being close to family like it's it's no wonder i 
both parents working, all these sorts of things. Like I, I don't, I can't understand even how any families stay together, you know, and most yeah. of them don't like the divorce rates are so high Ridiculous, and, yeah. and it's just, it's just not right. Cause then the kid ends up with like, well, who's even, you know, who's even connected to me and why do I only see him every now and then? And, and they have even less support because they have one parent and maybe a, you know, surrogate or someone, and, you know, it's, it's, there are families that are super connected and that their cousins and everyone all live close together, but they're, you know, it's less and less often. Yeah. It's, it's you guys as well, right? Like you South Africans, one's in London, one's on the Gold Coast, yeah. you know, everyone's just moving around the world now. And it's, I guess, one of the consequences of, of this global kind of lifestyle. And it's great. Like there's so much good stuff that comes out of travel and I love travel and, but yeah, everyone living all over the place now for work and it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a big, big, you know, wicked problem, as they say. Like you, it's not one that we're going to solve today, Gareth. But there's, there's certainly a lot against the modern family, and I think same sort of thing, process-wise. Like there has to be a lot of conscious effort to keep a relationship together, um, to keep, yeah, to keep a family together, to to you know, and try to actually have some of that support as well where where we can. Like my mother-in-law is coming out again um, during January, so I can go on the roosters preseason camp because otherwise I, I wouldn't be able to go um, with the animals and stuff that we have now. But even like leaving my wife with the two kids for a week, like it's just not right. Like mm. it's fine if you, everyone else is around, if the uncles and aunties and cousins mm. and, you know, grandparents and, you know, it's no big deal to go out on a mission. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if you get, if you get all the answers on this one, you're, you know, write a book about it or you get the guest on that knows how yeah. to, how to work it all out. Um, but it also works the other in. way. You know, we spoke about, you, you spoke about now, Keegan, about living with your parents, but also the accountability that comes from your parents or knowing that your parents will live with you when they're old and you will take care of them. You, you just, a lot of those cultures, as you mentioned, Gareth, are just guaranteed when your parents are old, you look after them. And I mean, look how much money is spent in like these first world countries like Australia and stuff that are, how much is, is spent on like aged care and, but they're all sort of post boxed somewhere on their own and so much money is being spent and what have you for their, which is fair enough if, if they have nothing else, but you know, in those other countries, just like, well, come and live with us. I lived with you till I was, you know, 30, whatever it is. And now later on, I'm going to care for you again. And it's like this, the cycle of life, you know, which we so separated from nowadays, like, uh, we don't want to see that. We don't want to see that getting old and what it's like, but mm. we should be embracing both ends of the spectrum, you know? Totally. And the mythologies of that as well. Like I think Paul Cech is is getting some interesting thoughts around that, but like you, you become acculturated, like there's no culture, there's no mythology that goes with modern society because the, the elders aren't passing anything down, you know, with the shift in technology and stuff like our culture doesn't value the elders. Like it's, it's a, it's a strange time we live in and it's a dangerous time, I think, you know, and you mm. can see that in the, in the mental health statistics. You know? So yeah, it's a, it's, it's a big one. Yeah. So perhaps you could tell us what real movement project is actually, and, and a little bit more uh, about what you're doing. Yeah. So I guess it's a self-development program at the, at the heart. Um, it started with a focus on personal trainers and strength and conditioning coaches. I thought I would mentor other people to go and work in pro teams like I'd done. Like that's, that's kind of what I knew. Um, but the people who actually wanted to subscribe were people who were more working in private um, facilities and there's more and more private strength and conditioning facilities. So, you know, it worked quite well, but basically men between sort of 20 and 40 would be the, the target. Uh, and, yeah, supporting them on their on their journey to do whatever they need to do to make their project happen is kind of the the the, the basic sort of doctrine. Um, and the delivery was sort of a lot of you know online content and you know uh, groups and that sort of thing. You know, with the delivery of information, I think the biggest part was people coming together for two and four day camps um, and spending some time together and doing a lot of training, but also you know, reflecting and, uh, you know, talking about, you know, philosophy of living and education around those sorts of things. And yeah, I think a lot of it helped a lot of guys to shift from patterns of self-harm and low self-worth, you know, to attaching some more value 
to what they do and um, you know to their own yeah you know, how they treat themselves, but also attaching value to personal training and and uh, that sort of thing as well. Like uh, I really believe that personal trainers at the moment and and sort of gym owners and that whole sort of scene are the people that can make the biggest impact on other people's lives and you know on the health and physical journey especially because you know you get to see that person multiple times a week and you you know you really get to know them you get to go through challenges and experiences with them you know, where a medical doctor it, it, as great as they might be you know they're going to see the person when they're sick you know every now and then you know so it's it's really not the same opportunity to, to turn someone's life around or you know help them to live their best um, so helping people to understand the opportunity that they have there and to really value it more and to put more into their own education and continually refining the system and those sorts of things, uh, I guess is what real movement uh, has, has been around. Um, the relaunch, which is sort of just, just begun is starting with the new crew um, tomorrow, January one. Um, there's a bit more focus on sort of any, any guy, like any sort of member of the male population uh, who would like to, be able to believe in themselves more, you know, it, it, the fundamentals are still like get strong, you know, be able to do things with your body that you couldn't do before eat well, get to a body composition that you feel proud of. Um, and you know, can like learn, continue to develop yourself. So, you know, it's getting some training, you know, improving your body each day, looking after it, nourishing it well and learning each day is kind of the foundation. And then we sort of build out from there because so many people want to, they want to make a contribution to the world. They want to be entrepreneurs and they want to, you know, they want to do good things. And it's great to have that ambition. But then it's like, well, how are you living? You know, where's, where's the power going to come from? Like, why are people going to join your tribe? Why do people, you know, why should people even spend more time listening to you? Like, are you living in a way that if they emulated that their life would be better, you know? And if the answer is no, then you need to you know, start that. Like how, how are you living and what can you improve in, in the way that you're going about every day? Um, to then be able to transfer that, you know, and the, the more things you learn and the better you're living, and the more confidence you have in your own journey, you know, systems and philosophy. If you have something that you think is valuable there, then, you know, go and teach it to other people. But if you're, you know, if you binge drinking every weekend, if you are living on junk food, if you, you know, train every now and then, you know, which is a lot of, you know, personal trainers are still just average members of society. Um, or if you work a nine to five job and you're just doing those things around, around work, like, you know, what do you really have to offer the world? You know, most successful business people and entrepreneurs, you know, they, they've put some serious thought and effort into that, you know, that aspect of their lives. They have some personal discipline and they make their bed or they wear the same clothes all the time or they eat the same foods all the time. You know, like if you, you look at those little daily things, the little daily things are probably actually the, the really big things. So, that that's what it's built around. Um, the fundamental thing is humans have the potential to be great. Like we all can do great things. Um, and the, the fun of life is in, is in exploring those things and, you know, taking your, your physical experience, your mental experience, your spiritual life, you know, to another level. Um, and as you say, Gareth, as we were talking about before, like everybody does better in a collective. And if your mates, uh, and not on this wavelength, then it's going to be much harder for you to do it. You know? mm. So we've created social circles where, you know, there's, it's normal to not go out on a Friday, Saturday night because you want to train on those days or you want to catch up on some extra study or those sorts of things. Like that's more normal in our community. And it's not like the doctrine of you can't drink and you can't ever eat a burger or you can't, you know, but it's a general philosophy of like do more of the things that are going to take you where you want to go and do less of the things yeah. that you're not proud of and you wish you didn't, you know, default to, you know, so that's, that's kind of what it is. Some of the delivery and, um, and philosophy is making sense. Yeah. It makes perfect right. sense. Yeah. yeah that is, it sounds like a great, uh, a great program. And, and I like how you've like niched up with the people that you're targeting when it comes to, um, what you're doing, you obviously focused on strength as being like in training, I guess, as the, the sort of base for everything. Is that yeah. specifically because that's your expertise or you think it's like a fundamental for a person to sort of start from? And then off the back of that, where does like mindsets fit in with all of this? Like, yeah. yeah. 
I just think it's really hard to get your mindset right on point without physically manifesting that. Like listening to affirmations and positive content all the time. It's like, where does this exist in my life? And if you're trying to just derive that from your one project, like it's like, okay, let's set this one big goal with your Tony Robbins coach or whatever. Like you set this one big business goal or this one big financial goal. And you're kind of going towards that. Like I don't, it's not process driven enough. Um, I think daily process is where you get your power from and going after that one big target, either you hit it or you don't hit it, but there's not enough process within it to sort of guarantee long-term success. Mm. I don't think so. I think if you can look in the mirror and you go, yeah, like this is working or if you can go to a, you know, to a jujitsu school and, and you know, you, you feel, you, you know, you're strong in that environment. You, you walk this, you walk through your day in, in this physical body. Like it's, it's not everything, but I do think it is foundational. I think it's very difficult to be, you know, overweight and, you know, not proud of your physical existence and do optimally in, you know, in the business world and such. It doesn't mean you can't be rich, but to, to have it all, you know, to have good family life, you know, good sex life, great health. Um, it's, it's very difficult to have those things without having you know, physical presence as well. Like, mm. so I, I was thinking about last night, I was thinking about talking to you guys and I was thinking, is there one person, can I think of one person who's nailed all these areas, right? Mm -hmm. Like it is, it is like the ridiculous, wicked problem. Like, is anyone ever going to like, they probably are the great people of history, but like even the great people of history, like there's the, there's dark stories behind yeah. some of them in like in one area of their life, they weren't really nailing it or, you know, you wouldn't want to emulate them necessarily, but like to have a great body, you know, um, in terms of your nutrition and, and also to be, to be super strong or to be able to, to do whatever it is you love, you know, weightlifting or parkour or jujitsu or, you know, juggling or whatever it is that you're excited about, but to nail those areas of life, to have financial freedom and control, to have great social circles, um, and to have a great family. Like I was trying to think if I actually know someone who I feel has done that, who doesn't have, you know, I know I'm thinking, Oh yeah, this guy, like he's all over it. Like he's, he's, he's motivated. He's always on point. He's got family now. And then I think, Oh no, like he gets, he gets migraines all the time and he can't stop getting those migraines. Mm. And it's like, no, well, I wouldn't want to trade places with him. You know? Yeah. Um, I honestly can't think of anyone. I don't, I don't know if you guys can off the top of your head, like someone who you really feel like has nailed, um, all those areas. Uh, it's a, it's a super good question actually, because uh, exactly what you say, when you start to scratch the surface, sometimes there's often something where you go, well, you know what, if we had to trade places, actually, I'm actually quite happy where I am. I mean, uh, there's a few people, like you say, that will come to mind, but then um, I'd have to spend a bit of time thinking. Do you, do you have anyone specific that you'd, you'd think of, Gareth? I mean, I would, the only guy I guess would, and I'm just thinking guys, I don't know why there's just as many girls, I'm sure, but like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, but then you look at, you know, I guess, you know, he's tainted himself a little bit with, um, you know, cheating on his wife and having an illegitimate child. And, you know, so, so and, and also the, the thing is, you, you only ever know half the story. You know what yeah. I mean? You don't know anything else. You don't spend your day-to-day -day life with these people. And I think we also just need to accept that, you know, not being good at something or failing at something and whatever, that's just part of life. That's just part of being yeah. human. And mm. You're never going to yeah. be this amazing all rounded thing that, you, you know, you can be flipping good at something and not good at something. And that's okay too. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I think the fun is in like, you can't really opt out of any of those areas. Like, yeah, you're not going to be amazing at, you know, Japanese and golf and weightlifting and like, you're not going to be the best in the world at, multiple things like you have to choose the things but you can't really opt out of health you can't opt out of having a physical body you can't opt out of financial responsibility you can't opt out of like social circles you can opt out of family if you want to but i feel like those people are like kind of missing out on a big thing i'm not sure where you guys are at with, with that but um you know i think like for my friends some people who decide they're not going to have kids like I f once you actually have kids it kind of feels like you're having half a life like it's just such a big experience and such a, you know, such, such a formative thing. Um, yeah. So as much as, yeah, like there's a thing there, Gareth, like you need to have some acceptance of um, maybe I'm never going to nail all this stuff. And 
probably most of the people who I mentor are not going to be 10 out of 10 in all these categories. Um, but if they move in that direction, if they're striving towards that, uh, if they're seeing improvements in different areas, if they have more awareness of where they were failing before and it was causing them pain, but they didn't necessarily understand why, like then, then it's a good thing, you know? So yeah, we're probably not going to solve like what we're trying to solve with real movement. And that's, you know, there's frustration in that, but moving towards more of what we're capable of. Um, I can't think of anything more worthy to spend my life on at the moment. So that's where I'm going to spend it. You know, if I think of something better then I'll do that. But, yeah. I agree with you. Like if you can get those, fun, if you can just move towards the foundational things that you know are super important, then you, that's half the problem solved because you're actually moving somewhere. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and that's where, that's where the issue is. So maybe, maybe you could tell us what are some of the basic steps in your opinion that, that sort of everybody can, take pretty easily to move towards better health and better physical presence and, and some of the stuff that you're teaching? Yeah, I think the first thing is the, is the philosophy and it's, it is the decision of like, yeah, I actually would like to live that way. Like I would like to, you know, that's, that's a philosophy I want to live by and I'm actually not really proud of, you know, being a binge drinker or being someone who buys a gym membership and never actually goes or like, I think, being honest with yourself and making that decision is a, is a huge part of it. But does the decision come before the actions? Like, mm. you know, I, I like the, the Jordan Peterson thing, like make your bed, tidy your room, you know, like just do something that, you know, like I'm in control of this. Like it takes one minute, like, and I can be proud of that. And I know I can execute. If you can execute on that, then maybe you can execute on getting a podcast off the ground or, you know, getting to the gym uh, daily or doing one set of push-ups each day. Um, I think it's like anchoring off some key activities. I think that's, that's where, where it goes and making it ridiculously easy and simple to win. I think the mistake that a lot of people will make when they hear this kind of thing or they listen to Rogan or whatever and they're like, listen to David Goggins, they're like, yeah, I'm going to go run 100 miles. And it's like, well, you know, run two a day for a week and see how you feel, yeah. <laughs> you know, like or run one, you know, like, whatever it is, go for a walk around the block. Like, you know, it, I think it's the Tony Robbins thing. Like people overestimate what they're going to get done in one year and underestimate what they can get do, uh, done in 10 years. So, you know, you don't have to do everything in 2019. You don't have to like, you know, nail every aspect of life, but if you make some solid improvements, then you'll build on that in 2020. And by the time you're 40, by the time you're 45, like most people don't achieve extreme success until, you know, after 40, after 50, you know, so work towards that with some, some patience. Um, but yeah, today matters at the same time. Like there's always that dichotomy. So get some reading done today, whatever that is for you. Like if it's one page, just read one page. Like you've got a book there that you're excited about. Just read one page of that book. If you know that that's too easy for you and you're sure that you can get that done consistently, then, you know, read 10 pages a day. And, and, and stick to that. And then after on day six, you miss it and you think, Oh, I'm a bit disappointing myself here. Like I've, mm. I've missed day six. And sometimes that will be the trigger for people to stop, but it's actually the feeling of, Oh, I'm actually a little bit disappointed in this. Like I'm going to course correct, but that's what it's about. And, I, and I've done a podcast about recently, like 97% of the time you're off course. Only 3% of the time you actually feel like you're really going towards what you want to do. Like there's going to be things about this podcast today. You're going to think, well, I wish you didn't answer that way or stutter and stammer, or maybe I could have X, Y, Z. But because you see those things, then you course correct and you actually, you know, you fail your way to the moon. Like that's the story of it. You know, you, you take steps and, and eventually you get to a point that, that you can live from, you know, and yeah, it's, it's often going to feel like, Oh, hey! Doing a podcast with these guys. Hey, hello, <laughs> <I just woke laughs> <up. laughs> Maya. Hello, Maya. Hello, Maya. The joys of uh, the home office. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we love it. Cool. Love it. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that 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 like if you can attach value to those little things each day, like, and it's very difficult to attach value. You think, well, like, what what difference is making my bed going to make? And that's exactly the reason why you can't have a billion dollar company. You can't have a million dollar company. You can't have a hundred thousand followers or you can't have, you know, whatever, because you can't attach value. It's a simple little action that you need to take each day. And if the converse of that is true, 
if you can attach value to just getting your two sets of five done each day, you know, then, then you can get there. So like the specifics, Craig, I don't think it's, it's not hard to find specifics. Like mm. information wise, there's a lot of good books out there. There's a lot of good people. People know if you put any effort into it, you know some things that you should execute. That would probably yeah. make life better. Like just experiment with something that you think, yeah, that, that could probably make my life better. Um, make it something fairly easy and then, you know, build, build momentum from there. Like we're not in the time of information shortage. That's for no. sure. We are definitely in the time of execution shortage. You know, people can't get themselves to do the things that they wish they would do. That's, that's the whole gym industry, which I hate is built on that. Like people will buy the membership and they don't get the body. They don't turn up and, and get it done. And, and that the whole business model of most of the commercial gyms is, is run around that. And that's you know, something we differently with real movement. Like it's very community based and personal based and you're paying enough money that you're going to, you're going to turn up and get it done. And I think mm. that's you know, a big part of what CrossFit's done as well. Like it's because it's a little bit more expensive. People actually show up, they care about their times, you know? So there's that accountability of like, are you progressing towards it? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different pieces there, but um, I think it's, it's, it's buying into that, that philosophy. There's a book called The Slight Edge, uh, which mm. is really, really good. Have you, guys, have you guys come across that one? Have you read yeah. it? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a really powerful one that kind of builds on this concept. The compound effect is another, another really good one that just sort of simplifies it down to like, you don't need to be running a marathon every day. You don't need to be like conquering the world every day you just need to take a step forward like today needs to be a win and you need to be able to build belief and the accumulative effect of today if you keep doing what you did today will you eventually be very strong or very successful uh, or very you know valuable to to people around you if the answer is yes then then you won like you don't you don't uh you don't have to hit a home run off every off every pitch you know as a exactly kind of analogy yeah for sure. Yeah. There, there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of good guys, I think talk about like habits and stuff and, uh, uh James clear is one of them. He's just written atomic habits. And I, I think is just, like, one? I'll check it out. I haven't, I mean, I've heard it's really okay. great. Um, okay. uh, but I haven't read it myself yet, uh, but, but mm. we actually, we both really fond of James and, um, would actually love to get him on the podcast. Cause I think he has, has a lot of great stuff out there. Shout out, get him in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's listening to our podcast, but <laughs> someone, one of his friends will be there. Someone, yeah. someone the world's too small now. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, and and I guess Craig and I speak about this a lot, a lot as well. Like when you look back on your life, like all the small things that you've done, you know, they're actually the person you are today. You know what I mean? So because you. Uh, are nice to people and you say hello and good morning and you smile and because you open the door for, for, for girls and, you know, because you, whatever, whatever it is, you know, you, you generally like a good person, you, you have, you, you're, you're now enjoying a fulfilling life because people like you because you've done nice small things for them, not massive things, but just small things over time. And exactly what you're saying, like, you know, you can relate this to so many parts of your life and your health is one of them, your finances are another, and it's all actually about the small stuff, and it's all just about showing up and doing the small stuff. Yeah, and the, the opposite of that is also true. Like, you need to have a big vision, and like, there is a lot of value in having a big vision and having something that you would, you know, give your life to. Everyone's giving their life to something. You know, some people have chosen what that thing is, and other people ha haven't, and days are ticking away, you know, day by day, live in someone else's dream and, and whatever, you know, like that side is also true. Um, so it's, it's, it's both ends of the spectrum. I think in the past I've been good with helping people to attach more value and, and go after a bigger target. Like, I think that's where real movement started was like a lot of people thought, well, yeah, like why, why can't I do it? Like, why can't I open a facility? I'm only 23, but who cares? And there's a bunch of guys who like, they're like 23, 24, 25 and they have their own gyms and they're making like, big six figure incomes, you know, and they're, they're running these organizations and they're, you know, when I was backpacking and completely lost, you know, like, and <laughs> it's part of it is having that big dream. Um, but then, yeah, like on the other, I, I wasn't great with probably helping them to say like this, well, these are the things each day. And, but that's probably more of the focus now. And this 2.0 version is like, just keep getting little things done because yeah, that's what's helped me to rebuild momentum. And, and I think that's also what, where we're most valuable is like 
what's the problem that you personally would most like to solve in your life at the moment? Like what's the thing that you, you, you know, you want to get better at or you're excited about, you know, improving like somewhere around that is probably what you should be teaching. You know? And that's, um, yeah, I think that it's, it's a funny thing because you, you never feel like you're ready because you haven't learned it to the extent that you would like to learn it but it's because you're so passionate about it and because you're so interested in that area, like that is the area that someone's going to be behind you on the journey and they'll be happy for you to help them up. Like yeah. you don't have to break all the world records in an area, you know, to be able to help people to get to where you've got to. Um, and then that challenges you to go to another level in what you're doing yourself. And, and that's like, that's kind of the, the journey of it, the fun of it. Uh, A yeah. bit of purpose involved there too, then as well. Yeah. hundred percent. That's, Life with purpose is yeah. makes you know, makes all the difference. So I think that's that's ultimately what we're trying to find here is, you know, to give meaning. You know, and that's yeah. it's missing. It's it's not inherent the meaning meaning of you know meaningful existence. And with that lack of survival, you know, the fight for survival, we have to invent you know that meaning. And that's also an opportunity. Like we we can invent and create. And that's what's exciting about this time is like there's so much opportunity to invent and create. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so your life has obviously changed a fair bit um, <laughs> over the years and recently too. And can, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, farm life and what it's like to also have your own animals. And I, I'm not sure if you, you sort of killing your own animals and eating your own animals or how that works, but that'll be quite interesting to find a little bit out about. Yeah. So yes, yeah, I, I slaughtered a pig the other day uh, for the first time on my own. I had a friend staying here who's like right into hunting and stuff, but he, he had to leave suddenly and we were sort of planning to, to do the first one, you know, together. Hmm. And then he had to leave suddenly and I was like, Oh, I just need to, I need to have this experience. And we have too many pigs. Like it's, uh, there's, there's some challenges with, uh, keeping them housed, also fed, but mostly housed. Um, so yeah, it was definitely time. It was pre-Christmas. Like it had always been the plan that they wouldn't all be there uh, after Christmas. Um, and so, yeah, that was, uh, that was a morning activity um, maybe 10 days ago. And yeah, it was, a, it was a, a big experience. And it sounds weird to maybe to say that it's something you're proud of, but I, I am proud to have been through that experience. Like to, I guess it's a self-management thing where, you know, you, you execute on something and you, you know, you get something done that you didn't know you could do before. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a sense of achievement in it as much as it's, you know, it's, it's a tough thing and, you know, it's a, it's a sacred thing, I guess. And it's, it's, it's really is a part of human existence and human life that, you know, we've become detached from, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging, but at the same time, I'm really, I'm really glad that I've been through it. And I think it is something that people who consume meat, and I, you know, I do believe that meat is foundational for, for health. Um, people who consume meat should have some understanding of, of that process. And, you know, I know that I was pretty detached from it, having grown up in the city. And you know, I'd been to quite a few farms, but even yeah, even still, uh, I was pretty, pretty detached from that sort of process. And, um, but yeah, apart from that side of things, um, just seeing the animals just make their way around the property each day and find their food and interact with each other. And there's always something going on. Um, uh, seeing the kids get really comfortable with the animals has been a highlight as well. Like they went from like not really feeling that comfortable with them to like, you know, within a couple of days, they're like carrying the chickens around and <laughs> you know, carrying the guinea pigs around and, yeah, my little guy has just turned two and he's like holding the geese, you know, when they were babies and they're basically like the same size as him. And um, yeah, like all of that journey, seeing, you know, milking, we have a milking goat. So we like milk, I milked the goat with my wife and initially the goat didn't really want to be milked that much and, <laughs> because we'd got it from someone else and, she, you know, she was used to being milked by someone else. So like that initial challenge of sort of wrestling the goat and uh, getting that job done was like, yeah, cool experience. But like, again, like something that forms a relationship, right? Like I think um, that was another part of the motivation for it as well. Like just to have something in common and collective that I work towards with my wife, you know, because my business is like online and kind of, you know, abstract in the, 
compared to bricks and mortar kind of business of the mm-hmm. past, um, she doesn't often feel that connected to that. And we work on that sometimes as well. Like there's definitely things that she, we could be more connected with on that, but this is, you know, the farm has been something that we're able to connect on and definitely like milking the goat is like, it was a big kind of thing to be able to do together. And initially like she was sort of squeezing on the udders and there was no milk coming out. And I was like, what's, you know, what are you doing? Like, why, why doesn't it work anymore? I'm watching YouTube videos and I was kind of explaining. <laughs> I was like detaining the goat. So my, my task was like to keep the goat kind of under control. So <laughs> pick the bucket away and um, run over us or anything. So, yeah. So like, yeah, it was, it was all an adventure and it's been a big adventure. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to get to the point of really being a, a useful, productive farm in terms of like having enough animals to make a, you know, significant contribution to when we have camps here for food and that sort of thing. Everything is kind of working on, breeding i think you know i think there's i think there's going to be some baby rabbits and some baby guinea pigs and <laughs> they eat guinea pigs in latin america so that's kind of where i got the the idea from that from they, they all like the ones that just live on grass like geese eat a lot of grass as well so they're kind of a bit more permaculture um sustainable agriculture kind of friendly so yeah all of those things have been a huge yeah, it's been a huge experience just looking after them, you know, getting the animals, looking after them. And I was pretty squeamish with a lot of the processes, like even just kind of when you pick up a chicken and it tries to flap its wings and all that stuff, it's kind of gives you like a startle. And mm. I hadn't grown up with, with a lot of that stuff. So like, there's a lot of simple things. I don't know what you, where you guys grew up, but mm. there's a heap of learning in just like crazy simple things that if you, you know, a farm kid would take it for granted and kids that grown up in country Australia would be like, what the hell are you talking about? Like mm. all this stuff's normal. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't normal for me. And I love, you know, that new experiences and what Real Movement is built around and, you know, what my, my life really has been built around is like, I'm interested in that. I should dive into that thing and, and experiment with it and, and see what it feels like. And, you know, I did that with backpacking and, you know, with learning, learning Spanish. And that's, that's kind of the thing with learning juggling and, you know, basic guitar and hand balancing and, all the things that I've taken on, it's basically been like, I'm, I'm interested in that. Like I would like to be able to do that. Like I should have a go at it and see, you know, see what that feels like to, to actually do it. And you know, the, what you actually choose is pretty arbitrary, but to be doing those things, to be going through process and choose some things that you want to get really good at and other things that you just want to dabble in. Mm. I'm definitely dabbling in farming. Like if you, if you come and visit Craig, I don't know what you're, if you uh, sure, want to come man. down, but for sure. you'll see that I'm dabbling in farming. Like it's not a, it's not a slick productive, you know, thing that we're, we're doing here. If I ever get to having that, if I ever get to having like a really organized homestead farm, like I, I will have made it like that's, that's kind of the opposite of my nature in a lot of ways. So yeah, it's like that. Like what we're talking about, like nailing every aspect of life is not something that's you know comes inherently or is easy to do. So yeah, we'll see if it's uh, if it becomes something that I work towards mastery in, or if it if it's more of a like a dabble kind of thing on the side. It's it's not my primary passion. I do enjoy learning about you know looking after the animals and and that sort of thing, but I'm not spending a lot of time on you know getting to the highest level with that compared to you know, the other things that, that I'm, you know, that I'm interested in. So, yeah, but I think it's, it's all like, it's all like what you say, the fun, foundational stuff. And, and we, Gareth and I were speaking about one of our themes for this year is getting back to basic simplicity uh, and, you know, be, being within nature like you are and, and immersing yourself in that you, you can't get more basic. And I think what you said earlier is that disconnect between where we are generally in the world to actual real life, like with animals and things is massive, you know, like, and I think it's just for you as an individual to, to be able to do that um, and leverage that information in um, your, the circle of life and health and teaching experiences for your kids. I think it must be massive. Like my wife is, um, I grew up on a farm and uh, in South Africa and the story she tells, like she's this ultimate animal lover, right? But you know, she's told me all the stories about being on the farm with animals and, but, but it's still a loving thing, even though you yeah. have to kill an animal. I think people like, can't see necessarily. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, and I mean, the, I think the, 
I think the, in terms of a learning opportunity for, for a family, I think a, a farm is actually a really awesome thing. So it's more than just being productive farm, you know, that's, and I guess that's what you are alluding to anyway, but uh, it's yeah. really cool. And I really want to come and check it out because um, that's sort of our goals as well. Like um, with myself, uh, my wife, Gareth, a little bit as well. Um, and the permaculture side of it, that's a philosophy first, yeah. not, not just a, you can live off the land like and it, it all feeds into the same f- sort of um idea funnel and um so it's really yeah. cool that you're doing that yeah the full systems thinking of permaculture can be applied across you know and the uh what's the one holistic management i think is the alan savory you know concept out of zimbabwe which i think is really really powerful as well around land, land regeneration and yes yeah it's, it's the whole world of cool stuff in, in agriculture when you get into that that holistic side, lots, lots and lots of lessons um, to learn. But yeah, I guess it's a bit of a pushback as well. And, and so many people say it, Craig, like so many people say, that's our dream. Like, oh, my wife would love to do that or whatever. Yeah. Like, it's ridiculous how many messages people send of like, I don't know if they know what they're getting themselves into, to yeah. be honest. Like, sometimes I feel like writing back, like, mm, come and stay for a week and see, you know, see if you <laughs> still think that after. Totally. But it's kind of a bit of a pushback from that, you know, the Elon Musk view of like, we're going to tighten the interface between man and machine and, you know, outsource the brain and all that sort of stuff. And I I don't see that future being a healthy one or a positive one. Like those things are all gamifying our dopamine response and all that sort of stuff. And it's, I just don't think that that's the future that we should be striving towards. Like, I think, yeah, getting, you know, more connection to nature rather than less is, is, Mm the way forward and the natural highs and rewards of time in nature. And, you know, I can sit and watch the goats eat for half an hour with the kids in my lap and we'll like literally just sit there and, you know, sometimes we'll talk, but most of the time we'll just like sit and watch them just eat. And that is a very human thing. And that's a slow brainwave thing. And I think we're meant to have some time of the day that's like that, you know, and yeah, we can, you know, I can then be on my Insta story and like buzzing people from all over the world and asking them questions and, you know, trying to, trying to inspire them or get them thinking about something or saying thank you or whatever. Um, I love that I can do that from here and I'm not completely rejecting the technological world and trying to, you know, go back to being a caveman, but having some of that time in nature and, and, you know, having some of that at home, I think is, yeah, it's, 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 I think a lot of people have taken note of of that and are striving towards that and, and, you know, the opportunity to move away from cities it's great it's crazy that we're working more and more especially if it's things that we're not passionate about you know if you're if you're working more and more and it's what you're in love with then that makes sense but you know we have with the technology and stuff that we have right now like people predicted that we would have 20 hour working weeks by this stage you know like Earl Nightingale you know, I don't know if you're familiar with his stuff but he he had amazing radio shows in the sort of 60s 70s where he was sort of predicting a hydrogen fueled future like by a long time before now and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, Japan's finally doing it now, but it's like, there's so many solutions to the problems of our time, but it's almost like we're just so distracted in uh, technology and yeah, like we're having our goals pulled towards things that we shouldn't really be striving towards in, in material things of, you know, what shirt you're wearing, and what, whatever that we're, you know, we're missing the opportunity of, of this time, I believe. And that's, that's the, that's the mission. The journey is to help people to at least, you know, think more deeply about what they're spending their, their time and energy on and, and uh, taking it more in the direction that they actually want to go. Like if you really want to farm Craig, then, you know, what, what will it take? You know, and a lot of times when you really sit down and think about it and you, you, you map it out, like it's not that far out of reach. Like our place, is half as much as it would have cost to have a house in Sydney, you know, to have yeah. a, a detached house on a normal block in Sydney, it costs a lot more than what it does to live here. And you think, well, yeah, but I can't generate money from there. But you know, what if you could, you know, how yeah. could you, like, what, what would it take? Like how many years would it take you to get to a position? And it's easy to drive to the Gold Coast from here or somewhere like exactly. that as well. Like it's, it's 30 minutes to, to the airport, you know? So um, people can often find solutions a lot faster than they, than they think they could. Yeah. But the battle is attention. You know, ask yourself good questions and put attention on things that matter rather than putting your attention on all sorts of other things. Like that's the, I think the biggest challenge of our time as much as we've, we've spoken about lots of different um, 
challenges of, of this time, but the, the, the challenge for attention, the battle for focus and attention is like there's so many things that want our attention all the time to distract us and mostly to advertise to us, to influence, you know, our thinking to, towards buying decisions. Like that stuff is really, really powerful and well-programmed. Um, so what's the, you know, what are we focused on and what are we, you know, that, that where are you putting your eyes each day? Like it's a huge accountability challenge you know, to, to work on. Yeah. yeah, it is for sure. There, there's a guy that, uh, well, I personally have a man crush on, and I think Craig likes him quite a lot to you, <laughs> but his name is uh, Yuval uh, Noah Harari, um, and he's written some like incredible books. And uh, his main thing and main challenge, he says that humans face uh, as of now is finding clarity. And that's because there's so much information out there, and particularly there's so much bad information that you really need to be careful and selective with the, with the information you take in and uh, make sure that you take in good information um, because if you're not you're just getting confused and the confusion will, will will cause over you know being overwhelmed and that gets you kind of nowhere in life so mm-hmm. what it just ties in nicely with exactly with what you just said there um so so keegan just um you know we, we've sort of come to to the end now but you always like to ask our guests um one particular thing so what does being ridiculously human mean to you ridiculously human yeah i think it's all the things we've been talking about like being having a connection to nature having a connection to great people choosing how you want to live and and executing on that knowing that you're going to fail most of the time i think that's pretty human as well you know but uh, i think we're goal-seeking organisms and and we need to you know, focus you know, on, uh, on moving towards a, a, you know, something that we want to move towards, like in our, our activities taking us towards something that we actually want. Like that's mm. being human is ridiculously human, moving towards what you want most and, and evaluating that, that process. I think that's, uh, yeah, I think we, I think, I think we covered a lot of that, you know, through, yeah. through what we're talking about today. It really is like, what's a good life look like, you know, and that's, yeah, it's cool that you guys are opening a forum around that and I hope some people, you know, get a few thoughts and spark of, you know, some, some different activities or actions based on um, today's podcast. And yeah, it's sure. always good if you do listen to it and you hear some feedback, like it's, it's always fun to, to get that. I'm sure you guys appreciate it as well. So. Of course. Um, well, that's, that's one of the things we love about what you're doing, Keegan, is because you, uh, you self-proclaim not perfect, you know, and, and, but you're asking good questions and, I think we should all be asking good questions of ourselves. So, because if you don't actually look at yourself in the mirror and ask difficult questions, sometimes, like you say, how do you actually know where you are going? And, um, and sometimes you don't like what you see, but then you can course correct. So it's all about asking the right questions of yourself. And, um, and, and that's kind of the stuff that you're doing. So we really do encourage uh, you guys listening to this right now to, to go and check out what Keegan's doing. Um, maybe uh, you can tell us a few things, Keegan, first of all, uh, what are you up to moving forward and how can people get in touch with you uh, and get some more information from you about what you're doing? Yeah. So the focus really is uh, with the you know, real movement uh, mastermind and mentorship. So there's an online only version and then there's a version that includes the, the four day intensive experiences. Like that's my, my biggest focus at the moment. So yeah, if you are looking for, direction and support community around you know, some of the things that we're talking about here. If it resonates, then yeah, send me a message and we can, I can explain sort of how it, how it work goes down. Um, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty accessible and we've had some really good results. So if it, if it makes sense, that would be cool. Um, other than that, most of my social media interaction is sort of through uh, Instagram at the moment. It's the one that seems to be working best and I enjoy most so I'm on there as Keegan underscore Smith and then there's a real movement uh, channel as well which is starting to get a bit more activity on it so mostly uh, mostly my stories on there is sort of where I interact but um, yeah there's some stuff on realmovementproject.com there's a lot of blogs in the past as well if you prefer that that form of uh, media the written stuff but um, yeah I'm pretty pretty responsive and open to uh, supporting people on their journey. So I, I spend a decent amount of time each day helping people with uh, things that they'd like um, support with questions and stuff. So don't be afraid to, to reach out and say hi. 
Like how to milk a goat, for example. That's <laughs> something, something that a lot of people are trying to solve, right? You can see that being like 100,000, uh, 100 million YouTube views. <laughs> yeah, I must have had to laugh when you said you, you checked out YouTube how to milk a yeah. goat. <laughs> Everything's on YouTube now. Did, man, did right? you do it Beautiful. for us? I checked out a lot of pig slaughters as well. Did you do oh, pig slaughters as well? Oh, wow, that's crazy, man. That's interesting. There's a lot of bad ones too. Oh, yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. Keegan, um, I just wanted to say, like, seriously, thank you for this chat. It's been, it's been really, really cool chatting to you. Um, when Craig sent through, like, the storyboard and stuff for this conversation, I just got super excited because a lot of what you do uh, ties in, I guess, with, with my thinking personally, but also Craig's thinking too and our podcast. And it was like, it was like a few buddies, like, having a, having a chat. And uh, I, I love your philosophies. Uh, I love the way you think um about the world about uh, communities and about what life is actually all about and i think it's really really powerful what you're doing um i'm sure that you are going to help tons of guys and uh we really really like you know support you in that um so but just thanks for for a real cool chat i, I had a great time thanks for being such a great guy and uh just wish you all the best going forward yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I really yeah, appreciate the opportunity. I, I love uh, exploring these ideas and you always get a bit of clarity through the conversations as well. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's great that what you guys are doing and, you know, I appreciate the, the chance to, to speak to, to you and your audience and, uh, yeah, look forward to connecting again in the, in the future. You'll have to come down and, and visit at the farm or I'll uh, hit you up next time I'm over in, in London. But, totally. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. And just, and just real briefly from my side, Keegan, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, uh, just thanks a lot. You've been a, a, a real sport uh, about coming on here and uh, uh, you are super interactive uh, with what you're doing. And it's just a pleasure to, to hear your philosophies. And I've certainly been inspired personally with a few things like I've picked up some juggling again recently because of what, like seeing your stuff. And it's, it's really inspired me to think about how can I have small challenges in my life, exactly what you were saying earlier. And, and it's something I've realized I want to do more of. Um, we've been challenging ourselves a lot in certain aspects, the podcast and, and business and what have you, but uh, I'd kind of lost my way in terms of physical challenges for a while. Well, I haven't been doing enough of that. I felt, yeah. and, um, and it's been super powerful just, you know, seeing like someone like you do that and then emulating some of the stuff that you're doing and thinking I've actually been feeling so much better within myself lately. Just, um, because I've like found these little skills that I'm like improving on every day and I'm, I'm kind of keen to go and do them. And it's given me, like you said, it's, it's like the farm. You, you have a moment to do something like that. And then you have a moment to challenge yourself in a different way. And as a human being, you need a multi-directional focus sometimes in that way to, to distract you from um, just being in one gear the whole time. And I think it's, it's good to have those moments. So I uh, appreciate the inspiration and keep it up. And we will definitely, Shanti and I will definitely love to come and say hi. She would be in her element. She's the farm girl. So we'll definitely come and, uh, and she knows how hard, how much hard work it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. No, I love that. Yeah. I appreciate kind words guys. And I love what you're doing. So cool stuff. Talk cool. again soon. Thanks. For All right. So let's, Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cape fold, mountain range. Gotta be quick.